My name's Andrew, and I recently built not one, but two epoxy river tables, having never built an epoxy river table before just now. This video is gonna cover every aspect of the epoxy river table building process, from sourcing and actually cutting your slabs to length, to building the forms and preparing it to actually hold the epoxy, to actually mixing the epoxy and pouring it within the river, and also how to remove the air bubbles, round over the table edges with the router, how to sand the table smooth, and how to finish the tables with either tabletop epoxy or this Rubio mono coat, which I think looks really good. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also gonna show you how to attach the table legs. Now, building these tables is a lot of work, but the final result looks really cool. So if you're interested in building an epoxy river table, keep watching. The first step in building a river table is to find some live edge slabs and you can find places near you with a quick Google search, but I have honestly found luck with Craigslist typing in live edge slabs near me and I found a spot within 30 minutes that had a nice selection. And after looking around for a little bit, I found four slabs that I'm gonna use for my two coffee tables. The size and type of slab you select is gonna depend on the look you're going for and I recommend that you check out Pinterest to get inspired. And after unloading the slabs from my truck, here's the first look at the slabs. Okay, so at this point we have all of the lumber out of the truck. Now we're basically gonna establish the size of each coffee table. I think it's gonna be around four foot by about 20 inches for one, and then we're gonna do four foot by maybe 30 inches for another. So I'm gonna take a look at everything. I'm gonna arrange it as need be. Um, based on how wide I want my epoxy river to be. So we're just gonna do a little bit of manipulation here. And then what I'm gonna need to do is use my framing square to make these edges completely square because we want our table to be obviously at a right angle. So right here, I'm gonna take this framing square and I want this to be obviously at a right angle. So if we take this framing square and we get it flush with this one straight line here, you can see that if we were to go to the corner, it's revealing there, so obviously it's the wrong angle. We need a right angle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this to the edge like I have, and then I'm gonna take a pencil, and I'm gonna scribe right there so I know where to cut with my circular saw. Pencil, I'll mark that right there. So for this piece of the river table, it looks like we got lucky at the, uh, at the lumber yard. It looks like they already milled this down and cut it at a 90 degree angle, because this one's just about perfect. If we get this lined up here, and we slide it down, you can see that that's perfectly flush. So nothing needed on this side, but we'll probably have to cut the far side. Now, instead of actually marking this right angle, what you can also do is you can take some clamps, put those right there. We'll take two, you're gonna need two, you'll do it on both sides. And basically, you can get that lined up on the back side of the wood, and then you can take your circular saw, you can use that right angle basically as a track and you can run your circular saw along it, which is what I'm gonna do. Using the framing square and the clamps to give yourself a perfect 90 degree angle is probably a better plan than marking it with a pencil. So you can see that I use this to cut all of my lumber to that 90 degree angle to get it nice and square. And at this point, I have both of the first two slabs cut to the right length and at 90 degree angles. And then I repeated this process for the second coffee table for both of those slabs. You can see right here, the circular saw didn't go quite deep enough. So I had to use a sawzall to complete that cut. And then I'm gonna go back later and sand the rough edge down. After cutting the slabs to length, the next step is to remove any of the dirts or impurities and primarily the bark from the inside of the slabs. Although bark looks kind of cool and you might be tempted to keep it, it almost always chips off later and it's probably gonna affect the way the epoxy binds to the wood. So best to use either a drill bit with a wire brush or an angle grinder with a brush attachment to get all of that bark off before proceeding. So at this point, I'm starting to take my live edge lumber and I'm just gonna lay it out on this four by eight melanine sheet just to get an idea of how I wanna actually build the form. After determining the final length and the final width of each of the coffee tables based on how wide I was gonna have each of the epoxy rivers, I marked the melamine form to match those dimensions and I used a straight edge clamps and a circular saw to cut a perfectly straight line across. Obviously a track saw or a table saw would probably make this easier, but sometimes you gotta improvise. After cutting out the base, I used a circular saw and a straight edge to rip three and a half inch boards, which are gonna be used as the sides of the form, which you'll see in just a second. And after ripping them down, I cut them to the appropriate length. Okay, so at this point, we have our form basically cut out to the right dimensions. We got the base here, we have the long sides here, and then we have the short sides here. So at this point, all we're gonna do is assemble everything together, screw it to the sides, and basically once that's done, we'll have our form created for the epoxy river table. Okay, so we'll start on this side. You see I have my saw horses a little bit offset so that I can rest this board right there. I'll get it positioned. 
And to actually attach the sides of the form to the base, I pre-drilled to prevent splitting, and then I just used some leftover cabinet screws that I had, but honestly, any screws that you have lying around your house are probably fine, but I do recommend that you pre-drill because otherwise you might have some splitting. After attaching all four sides, you basically have your melamine form constructed and you're almost ready to start doing some of the more fun stuff. But because these forms are gonna be holding liquid epoxy in just a matter of minutes, maybe hours, you definitely wanna seal all the edges with a silicone caulk. You don't wanna have epoxy leaking through the forms, leaking all over your floor. It's gonna be an expensive pain in the butt mess to clean up. Okay, so at this point we have our form in place. We've cocked all of the seams, so we have it hopefully leak proof. Now what we're gonna do is take our slabs and position it in place to see how everything looks. So fortunately we measured everything correctly and built our form to the right size so the slabs fit in perfectly and then I took a pencil and I marked the outline of the slabs. The reason for marking the outline of the slabs is to basically indicate where the epoxy is going to contact the melamine and I put down Tyvek tape since Tyvek tape and epoxy do not stick to each other in the hopes that when I go to remove the form in a little bit the epoxy won't stick to it. Then I took a little bit of caulk to basically seal the slabs down into the form with the hopes that epoxy would not seep beneath the slabs. There was a bit of a lesson learned with this strategy and I'll tell you more about that in just a second. Then I repeated this process for the second coffee table, positioning the slabs in place. And then finally, for both of the tables, I used a bunch of bar clamps to clamp the slabs down into the form to try and reduce the likelihood that any epoxy would find its way beneath those slabs. Okay, so at this point we have trimmed our slabs to the right size and we built our forms. Now it's finally time for the fun part, which is mixing up the epoxy. For this project, I'm using Total Boat Thick Set Fathom, which you can pour up to three inches thick in one pour. Let's mix it up. So for this Total Boat Thick Set Fathom, we have a two to one mix ratio. So two parts resin for one part hardener, and we're gonna mix it in a five gallon bucket. To determine how much epoxy I was gonna need, I used Total Boat's epoxy calculator to get the volume. So I poured in the first gallon of resin, then the gallon of hardener, and then the second gallon of resin to give us our three gallons in a two to one mix ratio. Then I used a drill with a mixer attachment to mix everything up according to Total Boat's recommendations. I mix for around three minutes and you wanna to try to minimize the amount of air that you introduce the epoxy by keeping that mixer underneath the epoxy surface for most of the mixing process. If you bring it above and below, you're gonna create more air bubbles that you're gonna to have to remove in the next step. You can also use a mixing stick to scrape the sides, but at this point we have our form ready and it's time to actually pour the mixed epoxy into the actual center of the table. I started by pouring just enough to coat the entire bottom and then I went underneath to check to make sure my form was not leaking. Fortunately, it was not, so I continued to add the rest of the epoxy. For this table, I added the entire three gallons of epoxy that we mixed, and this equated to around two and a half inches of epoxy thickness for that center river. And as we finished up pouring the epoxy, you can see here that we made it just underneath the top of the sidewall. Now you're gonna have typically a lot of air bubbles that form in the epoxy, and to remove those, you're gonna take either a torch or a heat gun, and you're gonna bring it in pretty close proximity to the bubbles, and you can see here that they immediately just pop and dissipate. Keep an eye on the epoxy for around 30 minutes after you pour it to see if any other air bubbles surface and then you can pop them the exact same way. And I intentionally left a little bit of epoxy in the bucket so that I could use it to fill any of the cracks or voids in the slabs. Here you can see there's one crack that kind of runs pretty long horizontal. I filled that in with epoxy and then I used a mixing stick to spread it out and give us a nice thin layer. You want to try to fill in most of the voids during this step. Okay, so at this point, we finished the pour for the first epoxy table. Now we're gonna pour the black resin for the second epoxy table. For this table, we're gonna use Total Boat Thick Set Fathom again. The only difference is we're gonna use this mica powder to give us the black color for the epoxy. We're gonna mix everything up in a five gallon bucket just like before, and we're gonna use a drill with a mixer attachment. So just like before, we're gonna use our two to one mix ratio. That's two parts resin to one part hardener. We're gonna mix everything up in the five gallon bucket here, and I use just a little bit more than three gallons on this project since this coffee table is a little bit larger than the clear one we just poured. 
After mixing the epoxy and hardener together using the drill and mixer attachment, I started to add my mica powder. Typically, you're gonna add around three to four ounces of mica powder per gallon of epoxy. We have around three gallons here, so I added around 10 ounces of the mica powder, and I gradually mixed it in using the drill and mixer attachment. You wanna to continue to mix until you have a nice uniform blend and you don't see any kind of clouds of the mica powder. For me, this took around three minutes of mixing. After mixing the mica powder into the epoxy, it was time to add it to the river table just like before. I poured in the first layer, made sure we didn't have any leaks in the form, and once I confirmed that, I added the rest of the epoxy until we built up around two inches of thickness within that second black coffee table river. I continued to add the rest of the epoxy to the center river, and as you can see, there were a lot of air bubbles that were created during the initial mixing and also the mixing in of the mica powder. So we're gonna use our torch or a heat gun, just like we did for the other coffee table, to remove all of those air bubbles. And to do that, bring the heat within six inches of the epoxy surface. Keep an eye on the table for around 30 minutes after you pop the initial bubbles to make sure no other bubbles surface. After pouring the epoxy, you want to wait around two to three days to let the epoxy set up. Now we're going to go in and remove the melamine forms. So after letting the epoxy cure, I'm removing all the bar clamps. And then what I'm going to do is remove the screws and try to pry the forms away from the epoxy table. Sometimes this is easy. Other times you'll find that the epoxy has bonded to the form and it's kind of a pain in the butt to chip off, but it's really not too bad. And with a pry bar and a hammer and a little bit of determination, you can get it off, I promise. If I was gonna do this again, I would apply Tyvek tape to the entire form because no matter how much I tried to seal it within that river, some did seep around and it really bonded, especially on the bottom of the table to the form, which is this disaster. Uh, it's sticking to this epoxy really, really bad. So I'm having to like chip away and just pry. Ugh. It's just a pain in the butt. All right, we finally got to the last piece. All right, let's see if we can't lift this sucker off. Yeah, so that was a pain. But here's how the tables looked after we chipped off all the rest of the form. You can see here that we're gonna have to mill down around a half an inch to get that all uniform. And all the impurities you see and the things that don't look nice, don't worry, we're gonna take care of those in the next step. So that was the clear table. Here is the black table, which needs much less milling. And then I took it back to the same guy on Craigslist where I bought the slabs and he milled it down using his expensive fancy equipment, which if you're just doing like a one-off project like I am is 100 100% worth it. There are DIY methods to mill the boards down like a router sled, but it's a lot of work. It's kind of a pain in the butt. And if you can find somebody near you who can mill this board down flat, it's almost always worth the money. And it takes half the time. It's not nearly as dusty. Do you get the point? I, I really recommend this. So after around 20 minutes or so, we got both of our tables milled down to a uniform thickness, and here is how they look after coming out of the mill. Next up, I'm gonna cut just kind of like a quarter inch to a half inch off each of the sides to remove any of the impurities or where the epoxy seeped out. So you can see that thin line of epoxy, I'm basically just gonna cut that off using a circular saw and a straight edge as a track just to cut that off and get it uniform and looking nice. So I repeated that for all four sides for the first table and then did the same thing for the next table except on this one, it really needed it because so much of the form and the melamine was stuck to the sides of the table. So just like before, I set up my straight edge and I use my circular saw kind of as a makeshift track saw to cut off the minimum amount I needed to shave off all of the melamine and the epoxy. I tried to cut off the minimum amount possible to try and maximize the overall size of the coffee table. Obviously, a table saw is a better bet for this and you can probably do this a lot faster with maybe a slightly more uniform result. And actually the guy on Craigslist who milled this lumber down also offered to cut off the edges for an additional cost but I figured this was easy enough to do on my own so I did. Okay so at this point we're gonna go ahead and take a router right here with a eighth inch round over bit and we're gonna go from this really crisp hard line which would destroy your knee if you hit it into this rounded over edge and then we'll sand it down to get it nice and smooth later on so we're gonna go ahead and route around the entire perimeter now. So giving your table a rounded edge is optional, but I think it's definitely worth it. And as you can probably tell by now, building these tables requires a lot of tools and a lot of time. So unless you're kind of an avid DIYer and you really love the look of these tables, it might just be better to buy one. All the tools and materials that I use will be linked down in the description if you do want to tackle this project and want to see exactly what I used to make this happen.
So we're finally ready to finish these tables. And to do that, we're gonna sand with 100 grit, then we're gonna do 150, and then we're gonna go all the way up to 180. And in between each of these different grits, we're gonna water pop it, which basically means we're gonna spray it down with water, let the grains of the wood rise up. That way we can sand it better with the next grit. So let's start with 100 and get going. So I am not a sanding expert by any means, but I'm using an orbital sander here with 100 grit to start, and I'm going slow and I'm trying to go as uniform as possible over the surface of the table as well as the sides, and I'm taking care of any of the router edges that were left during this stage. As part of sanding, you might reveal some voids or soft spots in the wood like I did here. This piece was rotted out and I didn't notice it until I started sanding, so you wanna remove any of these soft or rotten spots. We'll fill it with epoxy later on, but you need to get it out of the way for now. Then I finished up with the 100 grit and I removed any of the dust with my air compressor. Then I used the spray bottle with some water to water pop the surface. I'm basically just gonna spray a thin layer of water and this is gonna cause the grains of the wood to rise. I'm gonna let it dry for around 10 minutes, 15 minutes until it's dry and then we're moving up to the next grit, which is 150 and repeating the sanding process. And I understand I'm switching from table to table here, but the process is simple. It's 100 grit, water pop, let it dry, 150 grit, water pop, let it dry, and then 180 grit, water pop, let it dry, and you can do one more with 180. So after completing the sanding process for both tables, it's time to go back and fill in any of those voids. You can see here, that's a pretty deep void there on one table and then another one on this table here. So remove any of the dust that might be in it with an air compressor, and then I'm gonna use Total Boat's tabletop epoxy to fill in these voids. So I'm just gonna mix it up according to the manufacturer's recommendations and pour it into the void and let it dry for around 48 hours for these. Only use as much epoxy as you need any excess epoxy is just going to increase the amount of sanding time that you're going to have to do in the next step here i added a bit too much but i tried to remove some of it with a mixing stick then if you have air bubbles remove it with a torch just like before for smaller voids that aren't that big, I recommend that you use CA glue to fill those since they take much less time to cure than epoxy. Only use epoxy if it's a deep void that glue probably wouldn't be the best bet for. This stuff cures in like 30 seconds tops and you can sand it down. So after letting the epoxy and the CA glue that you use to fill the voids fully cure, use 180 grit one more time to sand the table completely uniform and smooth. And I actually sanded the whole table one more time just to give myself a perfectly smooth surface. After you finish sanding, I recommend you use the air compressor to get rid of the majority of the sawdust. Okay, so at this point, it's time to actually finish the tables. And for this video, I'm gonna show you two methods for finishing epoxy river tables. One is gonna be tabletop epoxy. The other is gonna be Rubio monocoat. Let's start with tabletop epoxy. So for the first table, I'm gonna finish it using Total Boat's tabletop epoxy, and you're gonna mix that up according to the manufacturer's recommendations in the quantity that you calculate using the online calculator based on the thickness of epoxy and the size of the table. Typically, tabletop epoxy is applied around an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. And after you calculate that volume, mix it up and apply it to the table as you're seeing now. I recommend that you use a spreader tool to get the initial coverage over the horizontal surface of the tabletop. After getting the top covered, I recommend that you run that same spreader tool along the sides of the table to get that initial coverage. And then you can use a foam brush as needed to touch up any of the spots that are hard to get with that tool. After getting that initial coverage of epoxy, remove any air bubbles that might surface using a torch. Tabletop epoxy is a good finish because it's very durable, it's waterproof. You can even put this table outside after you apply it to both sides, but it does have a little bit of a plastic look and it kind of takes away that natural wood look that some people like. For the wood look, we're gonna use Rubio Mono Coat, which we're gonna apply right now. To apply Rubio Mono Coat, first get all the dust off using an air compressor or mineral spirits. Then you're gonna mix up the oil with the accelerator according to the manufacturer's recommendations. And I mixed everything up using a mixing stick as you can see now. After mixing it up, you're gonna apply it to the surface of the table and spread it around using a spreader tool. Use the spreader tool to apply an even uniform layer across the entire top surface as well as the sides and try to remove any large globs or puddles. You wanna have it uniform across the entire area, otherwise you might get some dark or light spots. 
After letting the Rubio Mono Coat sit on top of the table for around 10 or 15 minutes, go back with some rags or microfiber cloth and remove any of the excess product from the table. You really can't remove too much, so don't leave any globs, don't leave any puddles. You really wanna make sure you remove all of the product. And I started by finishing the bottom of the table and then immediately after finishing that side, I flipped it over and I finished the top of the table. Again, I mixed up more of the product, applied it to the top, and I spread everything out using a spreader tool. I think it looks awesome when you put the initial layer of the mono coat on there and you can see kind of the table come to life. You can see all the grains of the wood start to pop and you can get an idea of what this table is actually gonna look like when it's finished. I was really happy with how this mono coat looked on the table and spoiler alert, I like this one better than the clear table I made before. So after applying the mono coat to the top surface as well as the sides, you can see here that I'm using a little bit of polishing pad to really push it into the surface and fill all those voids. And this polishing pad was especially helpful when applying the mono coat to the sides of the table. So recommend that you use the spreader tool as well as a polishing pad. And again, I'm gonna link all these tools in the video description. After giving it 10, 15 minutes, just like we did before, we're gonna use some rags and we're gonna remove all of the excess product from the table. Again, you cannot remove too much. You really wanna remove as much of the product as you can. After giving the Rubio Mono Coat a couple days to set up, it was time to finally install the table legs. I got these table legs on Amazon and whenever you're dealing with a nice piece of furniture like this, I always recommend that you use threaded inserts to attach the table legs to the table as opposed to just screwing it in. If you ever need to remove the table legs in the future, say if you're moving, it's really easy to unscrew them and then reattach them later on, putting them right back in place. I recommend that you put a piece of tape on the drill bit to mark the depth that you need to go into the table and then you need to pre-drill all your holes I recommend that you remove any of the dust using an air compressor and then you're gonna thread those threaded inserts into the hole you just pre-drilled obviously the size of the insert and the size of the pre-drilled hole will depend on what size you order after I finished putting in all of the threaded inserts it was time to take the table leg position it in place and use suitably sized bolts to attach the legs to the table it was pretty easy for the first four there, but for the ones on the back side, I had to use this right angle drill attachment since it was hard to get the screwdriver in between the bolt and the actual leg there. I repeated this process for the other table leg, and then I also did this for the clear table, but those legs were not nearly as exciting, so I focused on the ones that were a little bit more visually appealing. Next, I bought a new rug for the basement, positioned the tables in place, and here's a look at the final result. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know down in the comments which table you like better. And as always, thanks for watching this one. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.